rejoice, revel, and rapture, ladies and gents, for the time of degreelessness is upon us once again. And to guide you through these twisted and troubled times, I'm happy to say that the illustrious, the immortal, the eternally humble champion of the people himself, Shanghai Pete, me, is back to bring the motherfucking ruckus. That's right, the never-ending torrent of perversity and non-stop criminal capers that ceaselessly threaten to consume the sanity of video game fans everywhere has been working overtime recently. And that means that our sworn duty to provide a spirited and profanity-laden rebuttal has never been more desperately needed. And as always, if nothing else, we aim to entertain. So roll the blunt, obtain the frosty beverage, and get comfy. It's time to get deep inside. All right, first up this week is the continuing saga of all things pre-order and new being completely and utterly fucked. Whether you're trying to find a new 3080 video card from NVIDIA or reserve a PS5 or an Xbox, odds are you've spent the last few days being exasperated and furious and don't have either one of the things that you wanted. And it doesn't look like that's going to change soon. So hopefully at some point, maybe y'all get what you're after, but doesn't look good out there. In better news, Serious Sam 4 just dropped, and I think it's awesome. Well, to be more clear, awesome to me. If huge speed fest over the top style FPS action is your thing, you'll probably think that it's awesome too. But if that's not your jam, well, this game is not gonna change your mind. Uh, next up though, Blizzard just announced that they're delaying the new WoW expansion, Shadowlands, until an unknown point later in the year. The pre-patch does drop the 13th, but as for the full expansion, Liz has no fucking idea. I thought it was weird that I got a beta invite so close to release, but now we know why. As someone who plays Classic exclusively and long ago gave up on retail, I find this hysterical, but uh, also probably the right thing to do. The last fucking thing anybody needs is another battle for Azeroth. Uh, those MAU farming mechanics, poorly disguised as overly complex and needless gameplay systems, do need a lot of time to get right. I can understand that. Don't want to chance anyone seeing through your nauseating excuse for innovative gameplay. Wow, it truly defies belief just what a howling pack of clowns the once great Blizzard has devolved into. In other Blizzard news though, always surprising good news actually, the previous CEO and founder of Blizzard, Mike Morhaime, has announced that he's starting a new game studio called Dreamhaven. This is interesting because as some of you probably know, he left Blizzard in April of 2019, putting the final nail in the coffin of old Blizzard and signaling for even the most dull-witted Blizzard fans that yes, it's finally over, officially. The Blizzard that we used to love is 100%, definitely, completely, totally, utterly, without a doubt, dead and fucked. And if you still refuse to believe that, I. I don't really know what you're doing watching one of my videos because <laughs> if you won't believe the evidence right before your eyes of that, I don't see what chance I have of convincing you of anything. Now at the time Morhaime left, originally everyone kind of assumed that he was going to retire and that's why he was getting out of the business, and for a while that seemed to be the case. But now, since it's been revealed he's starting a new company, it can pretty much be confirmed that his departure was not because he wanted to retire, but because he realized his Blizzard was long gone. Now, does that mean this new studio was gonna all of a sudden be OG Blizzard 2.0 and save us from the big bad gaming industry? Eh, probably not, but this announcement at least gives us some hope that that'll be the case, and in the modern video game industry, especially in 2020, hope is about all we have left. All right, moving on for our main story tonight. Finally, we're going to make an attempt at deciphering just what in the good fuck Microsoft thinks they're doing with this approach to next gen. From some of the absolute worst branding I've ever seen in pretty much any product to seemingly easily avoidable catastrophes like allowing Halo, of all things, to be delayed from what was initially going to be a launch day release, to describe Microsoft's next-gen strategy thus far as schizophrenic, bizarre, and obtuse would be to stretch the definition of understatement to its breaking point. By contrast, their clownish incompetence makes Sony, who has been doing just exactly what they always do, appear as a towering monarch whose dominance of the industry is unquestionable. While unsurprisingly not particularly inspired or exciting, Sony at least presents the appearance of a coherent strategy, not so much with Microsoft. So tonight, perhaps unwisely, we're going to try to figure out exactly what the hell they're thinking. Ordinarily, this would have been a daunting task to say the least, but with the recent news of their acquisition of ZeniMax for 2.5 motherfucking billion, it's become an errand of insanity. But 
nevertheless, we will try. Uh, before we dive in though, let's just take a quick few minutes to briefly go over my personal experience with Microsoft and the Xbox brand as I feel that'll probably help put my perspective into context. So get comfy, this could take a while. Get comfy and high, I should say. Part one, Shanghai Pete and the ghastly GameStop. Way back in the day, in an age long gone and best forgotten, I spent about two miserable years managing a GameStop. Those of you paying perhaps a bit too much attention to all the dumb shit I say over here may remember me mentioning that for anyone else. Well, now you know. I could probably do an entire documentary video series about all the shit that went down at my store and all the idiotic and often downright illegal insanity my friends and I got up to back then, but that would have to wait for another time. The reason it's relevant today, however, is because managing that terrible little GameStop afforded me many opportunities to directly interact with Microsoft people and became a big part of what would be my formative impressions of Microsoft in the games industry. Now at first, <laughs> this probably won't surprise anybody, I was one of those assholes that hated on Halo and refused to acknowledge even a single positive thing about the first Xbox. I was still pissed about what happened with Sega and the Dreamcast, and the last thing I was going to accept was a company like Microsoft, of all people, essentially just buying their way into the industry. I didn't care about the specs of the console, <laughs> or that cartoonish abomination of a controller, or anything else. To me, and many of my friends at the time, they were nothing more than a usurper trying to smuggle themselves into the game space under the cover of Sega's Death Shroud. And to be honest, <laughs> I'm still not totally over it. Back then though, while I was managing that GameStop, two things created a small chink in my resolve that eventually widened enough to allow a reluctant tolerance and subsequent acceptance of Microsoft to infiltrate. Now, the first was the way that anyone from Microsoft, including the Xbox reps that visited my store every few weeks, treated me and my employees. Now, the Nintendo reps were always, you can probably imagine, they're always these cringy, try-hard pricks brimming with insincerity and an almost willful ignorance of the products that they were supposed to be promoting. The Sony reps were even worse. Imagine if, like, the Chad Bro Chill or Johnny Six Pack from your high school ended up selling PlayStation shit. You know, Sony Polo tucked too far into fresh freshly ironed khakis, flip phone clipped to their belt, you know, these guys grinning with the smug arrogance of a used car salesman, but speaking with the casual, practiced hostility of an entitled brat who spent his high school weekends doing blow and date raping in the backseat of his parents' BMW. Those kind of guys. Now, few things are worse than someone who lets the minuscule amount of power wielded by a Sony GameStop rep to go to their head. The Xbox guys are the only ones who are always courteous, polite, helpful, and displayed a genuine affection and interest for their products. Or if they were just pretending to, they were fucking good at it. Uh, they would always show up with new games and stuff for the store's Xbox Interact, plus tons of swag and shit from me and my employees. They actively made me want to like them and Xbox. I realize that's a low bar, but they did clear it when so many did not. And later when I went to the GameStop Managers Conference that year, that same sincerity and genuine desire to offer a product that customers would actually find valuable was demonstrated all over in every Microsoft showcase and event. Now, just as a brief aside for those of you who don't know, back in the day, I don't know if it still is like this, the GameStop Managers Conference was like a mini E3 put on by the industry just for GameStop management. It was fucking crazy. It took place over like three days across a huge area of some super fancy hotel in Texas, whose name I am forgetting. Waldorf, maybe? I don't know. All I remember is it was fancy enough for me to feel slightly uncomfortable. Anyway, throughout my time there, Microsoft was the only company that made any sort of effort to actually sell us on their brand or displayed any genuine interest in video games at all. Their guys would constantly go out of their way and above and beyond to solve any issue or address any problems that we had. You need an extra copy of that game we we're handing out? No problem. You want more of those shirts for your employees? Sure thing. Require special accommodations for a product launch or pre-order incentives? We got you. I came away from that event thinking, god damn, Sony and Nintendo really don't give a fuck about anything except ensuring their shit sells. They even treat the people whose job it is to sell their shit like shit. Only Microsoft seem like they give a fuck at all about gamers, about the industry, their customers, or even me. Now, understandably, your initial reaction to this little anecdote might be to think, so fucking what? Microsoft and Xbox were still the new kids on the block and they were overcompensating in an effort to ingratiate themselves with GameStop, the biggest game retailer at the time. Big deal. And to be fair, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's exactly what they were doing. But when you're in the trenches on the front lines running a GameStop and you're forced to come face to face with the madness of unwashed humanity and all their disgusting, self-serving, entitled glory, day in and day out, 
anyone who makes that even slightly more pleasant or tolerable leaves a pretty good impression on you. Now, I didn't give a shit why Microsoft guys were so helpful or efficient to deal with, only that they were and that doing so made my absolute nightmare of a job easier. They actually tried. I'll take Microsoft pretending to care over Sony and Nintendo actively not caring any day. None of this makes Microsoft a paragon of virtue or a faultless gaming institution by any means. I mean, still fuck them. But it was enough to slightly soften my impression of them. And once I wasn't actively hostile to the idea of Xbox, it was only a matter of time until all those co-op FPSs that were released for it finally wore me down enough to start fucking with it. Actually, it was probably mainly just the FPSs. Uh, in an era where Wi-Fi routers were relatively new and shitty technology and our PCs still used enormous CRT monitors, being able to play co-op FPSs on the couch with all your boys using just a TV and an Xbox, it was a pretty big deal. Now, I would, and still do, view Microsoft as an unwanted intruder on the industry, but years of watching Sony display an attitude of casual indifference and occasionally even outright spite or derision for their fans and customers put their approach to this business in stark contrast with the decidedly more customer-friendly conduct of Microsoft. Again, to be clear, I still think they're both monstrous vehicles for predatory capitalism that wouldn't hesitate to take your last dollar if you let them. Only that it's been my experience that Microsoft cares just a little bit more about not immediately appearing that way. Whether this is because they have significantly more operating capital than Sony and are therefore less risk averse, or because they're more often caught on the back foot each generation, I can't tell you, I don't know. What I can tell you though, is that for better or worse, when it comes to gaming, the company I think more likely to pull some anti-consumer fuck shit, it's definitely Sony. Remember our previous lessons from Nuances for Dummies though. This is not me saying Microsoft are the good guys and Sony are the bad guys. They're both the bad guys without a doubt. I just think Sony has a worse record Record when it comes to pulling shady anti-consumer moves. I don't trust either of these companies, but I do trust Sony less. Part 2 Looming Defeat and Xbox as a Service so that's the tale of my history with the Xbox brand. Hope you all enjoyed that fun story and that it offered some helpful insight on my current perspective. Getting back to present day though, Xbox in 2020 is a far cry from the unified, coherent, and laser-focused gaming brand I was introduced to back in my GameStop days. So what the fuck happened? What are they doing? Well. Up until recent events, my interpretation of Microsoft's strategy for this gen was essentially that they were kind of giving up on ever winning the hardware battle and had instead chosen to focus on turning the Xbox brand into more of a service. It seemed that given the brand's current trajectory, the powers that be concluded that overtaking Sony to claim the lead position in the living room console battle was no longer a likely outcome or fiscally reasonable. Rather than attempt a complete rebranding, or worse, giving up, they opted to try the service route and reposition the Series X, but more so the Series S, as more of a stopgap measure, kind of an avatar and a symbolic reminder of Xbox in the home console space in lieu of a more active, engaged presence. That way, they would be free to refocus the majority of their remaining efforts on expanding and increasing awareness for the rest of their gaming network and platforms, you know, like Game Pass, Windows PC, and xCloud. This makes sense to me, and if it doesn't to you, don't worry, Little Daddy Shanghai is going to explain it. So, look around. While perhaps your individual experiences may differ slightly, as someone living in downtown LA with a pretty diverse peer group and frequent contact with people in both the music and entertainment industries, as far as I can tell, Sony has been and will always be the default choice for most people. It's not even a contest. The battle was over before it started. Obviously, again, purely this is anecdotal, but my personal experience combined with the general levels of hype I see across social media, this conclusion becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to dispute. Now, there was a time when Xbox looked as though they may have had a real shot at taking the lead, but that was in an age long past and now gone, most likely forever. The truth is, in the most important demographics, the PlayStation remains synonymous with video games for the majority of people. If Microsoft truly wanted to change that, they were going to need to come out swinging with something far far more impressive than a Halo game without a release date and a confusingly branded console offering performance functionally identical to their competitor. Sony has way too big of a head start and Microsoft knew they'd be at a disadvantage from the jump. Simply matching what Sony was offering was never going to be enough. Now, maybe at the height of Xbox Live and Halo Gears of War popularity, it would have been, but not now. 
And after seeing the reception that their multiple game showcases and the specs of the Series S received, I think it's obvious that Microsoft probably always knew that. For this generation, based on what they've done, I don't think they ever had any intention of challenging PlayStation supremacy, in the living room at least. So, if we accept the premise that Microsoft was never going to take the necessary steps to be directly competitive in the console space, the wisdom of their strategy becomes obvious. Ceding the field to Sony and investing renewed focus on the other elements of their gaming business that remain unchallenged is a risky move, but given the state of things, the only realistic one they had left. You can also view this as analogous to Nintendo's strategy of remaining competitive by simply altering the metrics by which the competition is judged. And keep in mind, the options Microsoft has to further the audience for all things Xbox are fairly substantial, though you'd be forgiven for having no idea that was the case, as up until now they've been doing a rather poor job reminding people of that. Whether by intention or merely unfortunate coincidence, I suspect all the advertising hype focus on Xbox hardware has left most customers with the impression that the other aspects of Microsoft's gaming ecosystem and services are at best a secondary concern, a minor perk of choosing Xbox, and at worst, something that they aren't even aware of or know nothing about. When the reality is that products like Games Pass aren't just major selling points by themselves, they're also standalone services that actively compete in totally separate product categories against other companies' flagship offerings. Even xCloud Beta makes Stadia look like an unfinished intern project that Google accidentally released. It's also important to remember that with the official demise of their handheld division, Sony's entire gaming ecosystem consists solely of whatever the current PlayStation console is. That's it. Microsoft's business strategy has no such limitations. So if they succeed in only slightly shifting the focus of the battle to a playing field where they have a much more intrinsic advantage, they could easily win in the long term. And this is how they could do that. First, consider the amount of untapped potential for Windows as a gaming platform that could easily be unleashed with even a minor commitment of resources and effort. Windows 10 alone has an install base of over 900 million active devices. Of course, yes, the percentage of those devices that could reasonably be used to play modern games via conventional means is, I'm sure, much smaller, but it still gives you an idea of just what kind of numbers Bill Gates' boys are working with. In addition, their Game Pass service remains one of the best deals on PC as well. Even though it does suffer from the standard flaws most gaming subscription services do, its current iteration still easily competes with the likes of GeForce Now or the Epic Game Store or something. If you add to that all the possibilities afforded by xCloud for expanding their reach and audience, plus the wide range of devices supported by it, in the face of practically unwavering mass cultural preference for PlayStation, a pivot and focus to promoting this area of their business, instead seems not only completely justified, but perhaps what they should have been doing all along. Part three, what have they done and how bad or good is it? So this was essentially the thesis I was going to use for a video that would have gotten deep inside Microsoft's current approach to this generation so that we could try desperately to make sense of it and maybe figure out just what in the fuck they're thinking. However, the recent announcement that they're buying ZeniMax Media for $7.5 billion has forced me to completely reevaluate this entire conclusion analysis. Yep, just when you thought it was safe to count Microsoft out, boom, they dropped $7.5 billion on ZeniMax Media. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in recent years, especially with all the news coverage of US billionaires and corporations like Amazon and Jeff Fuckface have been getting, I'd started to sort of lose sight of just how much money we're talking about when we say billion. So for contrast, remember that Disney paid $4 billion for the entire Star Wars brand. So 7.5 for ZeniMax and every last one of its subsidiaries is fucking extreme. That is a lot of studios and IP. The most relevant, in my opinion, being Machine Games, id Software, Tango Gameworks, Arcane, and Bethesda. So that means Microsoft now has complete and total ownership of the Doom franchise, Wolfenstein, The Evil Within, Ghostwire Tokyo, the Dishonored franchise, the Fallout franchise, and the Elder Scrolls franchise. That is absolutely fucking crazy. In fact, if you had asked me a few weeks ago, it's just about the precise level of crazy I would have said Microsoft needed if they wanted even a prayer of turning projections for this gen around. Madness. Looks like they might have some sick after all. Naturally, the first question that must be asked is, exactly how bad is this likely to be for us and customers? Or, by some minor miracle, is there a chance this could actually be good? 
Well, don't start sucking their dicks yet. We all know that monopolies are almost never good for consumers. However, if any company was going to end up owning all that IP, you can be damn sure I prefer it be Microsoft over Sony, that's for sure. Sony would likely just lock all that shit away on PlayStation Forever and throw away the key without a second thought. Maybe they'd throw us a bone with a few poorly optimized PC ports every five years if they're feeling particularly charitable, but that's it. Okay, so we know power consolidation monopolies are bad, but just exactly how bad is this? In a fun twist on an old favorite, let's break down not only the primary ways this could further rot away what's left of our beleaguered industry, but also how it could maybe, possibly, be good. Or at the very least, not entirely devastating. I told you we're all about hope over here. So let's start with the most pressing and immediate concern. How likely is it that Microsoft will totally fuck these studios by blindly chasing short-term profits in a reckless, myopic, short-sighted rampage? Fortunately, I think the odds we'll see the Xbox boys just swinging their dicks around like EA's business model are virtually zero. They don't really have a history of doing that, and as far as I can tell, their previous studio acquisitions like Double Fine and Obsidian appear about as unaffected by their parent company as one could reasonably expect. So no, I don't think so. And I'd be the first to scream about it if for a second I thought otherwise. And I realize that in most circumstances, flying into a blind panic would be a reasonable reaction to news of a huge corporation buying beloved developers. All evidence suggests that the ownership of these studios changing hands will not have any practical impact on consumers. So my verdict here is that no, I do not think that Microsoft will turn any of these guys into the next Bioware. May seem alarming at first, but <laughs> honestly, I'm not worried. Though optimism in any form is not my customary perspective on, well, anything. In this case, the facts of Microsoft's track record with their first-party studios are relatively clear, and they kind of take care of them, or at least they don't destroy them. Now, if any of you are shocked that I'm not using this as an opportunity to wildly condemn Microsoft, I would remind you that pointing out an objective good or an objective not terrible is every bit as important as highlighting egregious wrongdoing, maybe even more so. Ignoring demonstrably positive facts because they may be in conflict with the edgelord shock value that comes from preaching endless despair is, is just as dishonest as insatiably slurping the establishment knob. And whining about how everything sucks is eh, just about as insufferable and harmful as industry shills insisting everything is great. So unfortunately, I can't always just blindly tear this shit down. Sometimes you have to be fair, even to the video game industry, even to Microsoft. Okay, whew. so if Microsoft isn't going to run arcane or machine games into the ground by insisting they make a game totally outside their area of expertise or replacing the assets in their existing titles with microtransactions, then what will they do? And by that I mean, holy fuck, what is the exclusivity landscape going to look like for their upcoming games? Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop, as we all know, already have exclusivity deals on the books with Sony. Fortunately for Sony fans, Microsoft is on the record as saying they're going to honor them. Okay, but what about future games? All they've said is that they'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis, which just means that they haven't decided yet. And they want to keep people in suspense so they can use that to their advantage. So what does that mean? Well, that goes back to my initial impressions and feelings regarding how Microsoft, or at least their Xbox division, tend to do things. Especially when compared to Sony, they tend to conduct themselves in just a slightly more classy or customer-friendly fashion. Whether that's because they actually care about their customers, or a result of a particular business strategy crafted during a time when they were very much the new guy trying to ingratiate themselves to this industry, I have no idea, and I don't think in practice that it matters at all. Though I'm sure we can all guess which is more likely. Either way, it certainly appears as though displaying at least a surface-level penchant to always put customers and gamers first remains an integral part of the Xbox branding and product identity. After all the time, effort, and money they've put towards that impression, I don't think they're just going to nonchalantly nuke it from orbit anytime soon if they can avoid it, even if this huge acquisition seems to be a textbook reason to do exactly that. While I'm sure we would all prefer to see no change in their approach to exclusivity, the more likely outcome and probably the best compromise choice would be to do timed exclusivity for select Xbox and PC titles. For example, they could probably get away with six months of Elder Scrolls VI being exclusive to Xbox and PC, but not much more than that. But that also begs the question then, why spend all this money to further stack your stash of first party studios if you're not going to leverage that for exclusivity reasons? It's common knowledge that really good first party exclusives are one of the main pillars that will make or break a console. So why buy a dev like Bethesda if not to tell Sony and the PS5 to go fuck themselves when it's time to release Elder Scrolls 6? 
just to collect middleman publisher revenue? Maybe. Those games will definitely earn far more money if they aren't exclusively locked to a certain console on release. Is this indicative, perhaps, that there are some elements of truth in our initial theory, that they're focusing more on software platforms and services like xCloud, Windows, and Game Pass? Again, maybe. Does this give Microsoft too much industry power? First of all, yes, definitely it does, but if it was Sony, I'd be much more worried. Microsoft has shown that they're content to remain mostly hands-off, so studios like id and Machine Games would be free to remain business as usual. Something I think is fine, because with the exception of Youngblood, I think they've both been doing an awesome job recently. Same with Arcane and Tango Gameworks. Whereas I actually think they might be a positive influence on Bethesda. Real talk, we all know Bethesda can hardly get any worse right now, so if Microsoft is gonna have any noticeable influence on them, Odds are it would be positive rather than negative. <laughs> Besides, I'm relatively sure that no one can out Bethesda Bethesda. After the disastrous spectacle of self-immolation, better known as Fallout 76 and Elder Scrolls Blades, Microsoft may be the one chance they have to actually save their franchises. I certainly wouldn't put any faith in any of their current employees to pull off something like that. I don't know about y'all, but at this point, I trust Microsoft far more than I trust Bethesda itself to put out quality Bethesda games. Either way, while nothing is certain yet, the plain fact is, this is about leverage before anything else. How much and to what extent remains to be seen. Part 4. Does this change anything? I think we can all agree this is pretty intense, but what will it change? Will this adversely affect these developers or their current and future games? I, like I said, I don't think so. If anything, it adds further incentive to make the games as good as possible. After all, if you force a developer you just bought to suddenly make shit games their fans hate, you devalue your own investment and turn it from an asset into a liability. This just so happens to be one of those rare intersections where consumer interests and business goals meet, so I think we can relax at least a little. What about exclusivity? If you get a PS5, will you not be able to play Elder Scrolls 6 on it? I mean, I highly doubt it. Not only do many of these developers' games already have a history of being multi-platform, it just doesn't fit with Microsoft's MO to engage in petty bargaining tactics the same way companies like Sony or Epic do. Obviously, I could be wrong, or they could end up doing a complete 180 and holding Doom 3 and Fallout 5 hostage behind some new tyrannical multi-plat policy. I I just don't think that's likely, but it's certainly possible. The implication and implied threat alone is probably more than enough to get results, and Microsoft won't want to overplay their hand. I'm not saying that if it comes down to it, they won't ever go on the record with a statement confirming they'll have to buy an Xbox if you want to play Doom, only that they will avoid it if they can. There's one thing you can always trust a company on, and that's that they will do what's in the best interest of their bottom line all the time. They just want to make more money. Gutting studios with profitable reputations, making top-selling games, forcing them to tank valuable IPs, or restricting historically multi-plat franchises to a single market are not good ways to do that. Some of you now may be thinking that I'm giving Microsoft too much credit. And you might be right, but I don't think so. I don't think that they spent $7.5 billion on some of the best studios in the world just to ruin the franchises that are the reason they're so valuable in the first place. It makes no sense. Now, maybe you're thinking, what about EA and a developer like BioWare? It certainly at least appears as though EA did with them exactly what I'm telling you now Microsoft will not do to id Software and the rest, right? Wrong. While it may appear that way, you're forgetting that a company like Microsoft doesn't acquire studios for the same reason a company like EA does. EA buys a dev like Bioware so that they can fire most of the staff, replace them with contractors who work for far less money, and then have them churn out low quality garbage that will still sell because it says Bioware on the box. Sure, eventually after putting out enough games the quality of Anthem, that Bioware name will not command the same type of sales figures it used to, but by that time EA will have reduced the studio's operating costs so far that even if the games only sell a fraction of what they used to, they'll still profit. EA does not buy a studio like Bioware because they want to leverage the awesome games they make as an incentive for customers to engage with their product ecosystem. They buy them to use the Bioware name as a low overhead passive revenue stream. That strategy doesn't rely on doing whatever it takes to ensure the studio continues to put out high quality games everyone loves that are system sellers. That's what a first party studio is for. All EA needs is a name that will reliably shift a predictable amount of any game they slap it on. 
That's the difference between EA, a parasitic, destructive entity birthed from a disastrously out of control system of free market capitalism, and a company like Microsoft. Both operate within the same system, but unlike EA, Microsoft's business model relies on their ability to consistently create products that people actually value. Needless to say, EA's does not. They're both still terrible, of course. I'm just pointing out that they're terrible in different ways. So if they aren't going to fuck with the studios directly, what does this do for Microsoft then? The answer is that it gives them leverage. See, the implication here is clearly that the next installment in many, if not all of these studios' fan favorite franchises could easily go Xbox PC exclusive. And what sells systems? Exclusives. Whatever decisions Microsoft ends up making regarding exclusivity down the road, the implications alone could be enough to panic and sway some people. There's no question this is a big dick move, but are they actually going to make hard, possibly intensely unpopular decisions, or will Microsoft be content with just swinging their massive schlong around and having fun watching everyone scramble to get out of the way? Impossible to say. This is a move whose success, at least for the immediate future, relies more on people's impressions of it than facts or confirmed selling points. Very clever if you think about it. Come out with this announcement right before pre-orders open up, let the implications speak for themselves, and run around unchecked in everyone's imaginations, but then decline to offer any concrete or specific info with regards to how this will impact the industry going forward. Risky gamble, but given the current state of the console wars, one that may pay off, and more importantly, the only kind on the scale necessary to swing things in Microsoft's favor. So where does that leave us? I think it leaves us with the landscape of this generation of the console wars being completely changed. Microsoft now easily has all the tools they need to wipe the fucking floor with Sony if that's really what they want to do. Fortunately for Sony and their fans, I don't think that is what they want to do though. Remember that Microsoft has so much operating capital that if they wanted to buy Sony itself, they easily could. So while yes, this is without a doubt a big dick move and a serious flex if nothing else, it's not nearly as big as their dick could get. So my advice is just chill, grab whatever console you were going to before all this happened. After all, the only games that are even on the radar already have their exclusivity rights determined, and it'll likely be years before we see even announcements for any new games that might potentially be affected by this studio ownership change. They want you to go out and pre-order in a panic and buy up all their fucking garbage. That's what they want you to do. There's no need for that. Like, I, I, I guess I essentially just spent half an hour telling you that, oh my god, all this crazy shit happened, but you know what, in the end, it's not gonna matter. Cause, that's actually what I think. I think in the end, it's not gonna matter, and who fucking cares? <laughs> Big surprise, I know. All right, that's our show for the week. Thank you so much for chilling with us and spending this little bit of your free time here. We love you today. We love you all the way. Make sure you downvote this video. Leave a comment below talking about how I'm clearly an Xbox and Microsoft fanboy, letting everyone know that you didn't actually watch the video. And be sure to never, ever subscribe to this channel. I'm getting dangerously close to a 1,000 subscribers, and my ego is out of control as it is. I don't think any of us want to see what happens if I actually get a 1,000 people watching my dumb bullshit. Anyway, thanks. We love you all. We'll catch you next week. <laughs>